Hi, this is Randy Rice of RiceConsulting.com and Rice Consulting Services. In another one of my short videos on the principles and concepts of software testing. And today we're going to be looking at some of the principles behind risk-based testing. Now, I will be fleshing this out more in some technique kind of videos a little bit later. Uh, but right now I'm just kind of focusing on the why. Uh, we do what we do in risk-based testing and a little bit about um, the, the importance and the tie-in between risk and testing. Well, first of all, we need to understand that, that risk is a possibility of something. It's not a certainty, uh, and it's always a negative thing as well. Uh, on the other side of risk is the possibility of an opportunity or some kind of gain. So we take a risk to achieve a gain. We may take a risk on the project to have the gain of releasing the software sooner, uh, that kind of thing. It, it, it could also be a factor, uh, such as uh, a risk factor of heart disease or a risk factor of uh, having an automobile accident or something. So, but basically, it's, uh, it's the unknown. And that's what's so tricky about risk is because some of these may never materialize. Uh, so, besides being a potential, uh, there are a few things that we need to know to be able to really intelligently assess risk. Uh, so once you've identified what some of the risks are, uh, I think it's helpful that any kind of framework for risk, you have some kind of historical basis uh, about that. So like uh, using the car insurance example again, uh, car insurers know that based on your driving habits, how much, t how much you drive, where you drive, uh, the number of tickets you've had, the number of accidents you've had, your age, the value of your car, where you live, all of that stuff factors into the rate that you'll pay for your car insurance. Because they know that given the odds that, you know, and the combination of those factors that there's a certain likelihood that they'll experience a loss. Now, that data has to be correct. There has to be an accurate way to measure, uh, for example, let's say the accident rate in a certain zip code. Uh, if you are just simply guessing at that, if, or if the company is, then it really doesn't lead to very good uh, measurements and very good rating as well. And, you know, the people that do this for a living, uh, the, the risk professionals, the insurance companies, the weather forecasters, the financial companies and all of those folks, they all have methodologies for doing this. And they have, in some cases, very complex algorithms. Now, those aren't perfect because, as you know, the weather forecaster may call for a bright and sunny day and then you go out into training. Uh, so everyone misses risk from time to time. Uh, this year's hurricane season, uh, was an example of that. It was forecast to be a very heavy hurricane season, and uh, we've only had uh, a, a couple of, of small storms, uh, hurricanes in the U.S. And so sometimes it is very possible to, to be misled by your own risk assumptions. So this relationship between risk and testing is that the, the higher risk you have, uh, whether it be safety risk or financial risk or whatever, uh, the more that's going to drive your testing or should drive your testing. You're probably going to use uh, different layers of testing, different types of filters for your defects. You're probably going to go a little bit further in your coverage and you're going to be uh, more rigorous and your extent of testing is going to be uh, larger. You may have more user roles represented, you're going to go to an nth degree further uh, than if the risk was just low. But here's the thing, not everything is going to be a high risk. When we say the general risk, this could be the general risk of the project. We're going to do a lot of testing on the project. Well, what is a lot of testing and what does that mean? So let's take a step back here for just a moment and look at some of the types of risk that we might see on software projects. First of all, you have the project risk. And these all relate to how the project is being performed. They're around project management, staffing, uh, 
it, it could be third party uh, supplier relationships, it could be user interaction, stakeholder engagement. And these are the kind of things that you want to proactively identify even early in a project and then do something about those to help prevent a project failure. In fact, if you identify these and don't do anything about a risk, then all you have is good information. That you really haven't done anything. The product risk are those that relate to the thing that you're delivering. And this is where, as testers, we get very interested in knowing where the risk is in something. So which functions, which features are the most important, which are the least important. And at this point, I use the analogy as like packing a suitcase. You want to put your big and important stuff for, in first and then your small important stuff in around that. And then if, if you have enough space and weight, then you can put the other things in. But you may wind up leaving some things out of the box. But the, 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 the product risk simply helps us prioritize and focus our testing. Then you have the technical risk. These kind of transcend all the other risk. That they might be things like security, performance, uh, many times are infrastructure based. And these are things that you have to look at from a uh, all-inclusive standpoint uh, because they do impact so many other things. And, and a failure in one of those things can cause an overall failure in your project or product. And then finally, we have the business risk. Uh, these are the risk to our stakeholders, to our customers, and even to the business that we serve. Uh, this could be direct monetary loss. It could be loss of customers. Uh, you'll find that these risks can drive a lot of your testing strategies and who's involved in testing. So th this is kind of where the rubber meets the road for the, the executives in a company, and this is where they really need to be engaged is to identify these risks. And you may be surprised which of those they're willing to assume and which of those they're absolutely frightened of. And they'll, they'll spend uh, lots of money to mitigate uh, some of these risks. Now, the um, elements of risk can be boiled down to two things simply. The likelihood that something could occur or fail versus the impact should it fail. Now, in this slide, you'll see uh, th this picture. Uh, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, at leaving a class and going out to the airport. And I saw this on the front page of the newspaper with a headline that said, ouch. And the story is, is that uh, this guy, uh, he was the truck driver. It was his last day on the job after 35 years, I believe, without an accident. And so on the final day, he plows his truck into a house. But that's not just any house. That's an antique house. Been there over a hundred years. It used to be a stagecoach stop in the 1800s. And they just finished putting a hundred thousand dollars worth of renovations uh, into the house. Now, the reason I show the picture is once again, we can be fooled by risk. We can think, oh, okay, this driver, perfect driving record, 35 years, not a problem. The homeowner, been there for a hundred years, renovations, no wiring problems, far away from the road, no problem. And yet, look what happened. You know, it's like a bullet hitting another bullet. So sometimes things happen that we just simply don't anticipate. Now, conceptually, if we take this idea of the likelihood versus the impact of failure, uh, you could do a scatter chart, a scatter plot kind of chart. And down here in the low area, you have the low risk items. These, you know, if you make a change, you may just test the change and nothing around the change. You may just get some moderate code coverage. But now you'll notice about here the impacts start to become workarounds. And so now you have moderate risk. Now you have some major nuisances and some things that are obvious to people. You may choose to do partial regression testing of a change here with maybe 100% branch coverage. Now anything above this, we get very serious about. Uh, high risk, uh, this level three would have a high level of regression testing perhaps 100% path coverage, and up here is very high risk because of the high likelihood of failure. And it would have complete regression testing also with 100% path coverage. And what we want to do is work our way down 
from the very high risk area down to the low risk area in terms of priority. Basically, we don't want to really ignore anything below the high risk line because that would really show that we're missing some of the important things up here. So as we, as we look at this risk chart, we may have one degree of separation, of likelihood of failure, and it would have complete regression testing also with 100% path coverage. And what we want to do is work our way down from the very high risk area down to the low risk area in terms of priority. Basically, we don't want to really ignore anything below the high risk line because that would really show that we're missing some of the important things up here. So as we, as we look at this risk chart, we may have one degree of separation of, of error, but that, that's really uh, just about it. Now, the final few slides I want to show you here are, these are ones that I typically show to executive management because these are the things that people typically uh, don't think about in terms of risk. Uh, just about everyone thinks about the first one, incorrect results. Everyone thinks about the correctness risk. But we might not think so quickly about maybe unauthorized transactions. Uh, that would be a security risk and a control risk. We might not think about data integrity being compromised by some kind of data corruption, invalid input, that kind of thing. We may also uh, not think through the risk about being able to recover processing and replicate processing up to a point. So if the system does crash or go down, can we resume? Do we lose all of our work? That kind of thing. Also, usability is a risk. If the system's too hard to use, people simply will abandon it. Or if they can't abandon it, it's going to drag down productivity. And the system results could be unreliable. You may get one computation, one transaction, and another, the very same transaction, get a, a different computation. So there's a reliability risk. Also, that has to do with how, how often the system crashes, how often it's available, those kinds of things. Uh, your processing may not meet compliance needs of your company, of legality. Also, uh, software might not be maintainable, which would be a bad thing if you're buying the software and expect to use it for an extended period of time. You might find that your software won't interface or port to other uh, platforms that you need it to work on. And you might find that your overall service levels could deteriorate. This is kind of like a performance risk. And the system could be difficult uh, to operate just overall. The, uh, that would be in, mainly in the case of like a central mainframe uh, kind of operator system. Uh, you might find, might find that your system might not interface uh, with other systems that you needed to interface with, either your own systems or maybe those in other companies. Overall, your system performance might be poor. Your security could be compromised, let's say, by an external attacker. And finally, you might not be able to man maintain a continuity of processing. The idea of end-to-end -end testing uh, implies that we can drive a transaction from beginning to end and not experience a lot of failures along the way. So hopefully this gives you some uh, ideas and some perspective on uh, risk and risk-based testing, why we do it and why you need to be thinking about uh, does it have a role in your testing. I know some people say isn't all testing risk-based and in a way it is but there are some situations where uh, when everything is a high risk it's hard to draw risk-based priorities so we have to kind of use some other methods in those situations which we'll talk about in some other videos. Well listen if you want more information like this please come to my website riceconsulting.com if you want to get on my newsletter, that's easy too. Just follow the links below this video and you'll see the instructions on how to do that. Thanks a lot for watching.